Hey there again, Kentucky Keepers. So this is another video in support of our 4-H Invasive Species Education and Monitoring Program. So this video and this module is all about a lesson plan or an activity pack that we've developed for invasive species. So this is, you can kind of consider this um, a teacher's guide or an educator's guide to this lesson plan. So the lesson plan is called Invade It. It's, um, it's several pages long, it's got a lot of activities in it, and it's designed to be used by 4-Hers or other youth. Um, really, they could do it in a classroom, they could do it at a 4-H at a office as part of a club, they could even take it home and do it. So this, we're gonna kind of go through page by page to show you what's going on in this document and kind of what the answer should look like. Um, so this is a way that you can grade it and also some stuff about how you can send us information back once youth complete it. So once again, Kentucky Keepers, this is all about 4-Hers uh, learning about invasive species, 4-Hers teaching others about invasive species, and you guys even helping us to monitor invasive species. And once again, we've talked many times about um, what traits that invasive species have in common. We're gonna go through a lot of that on this, in this lesson plan, um, but here are some of those traits again. They're new to an area, they breed and spread fast. They cause problems for local plants and animals. Often nothing will kill them or eat them. And an invasive species is an organism that causes ecological or economic harm in a new environment where it is not native. So you'll see I look a little different here. Um, this slide had to be redone because um, things have changed since we first made this video. So what this map shows, and you may have seen this before, is that Kentucky is a place where a lot of invasive species are coming at once. We are having a lot of creatures coming to us from the north and a lot of creatures coming to us from the south. These are things that may have been in the north or south for many years and they're finally getting here kind of all at the same time. So the ones in the, with the yellow arrows are creatures that are already here and the ones with the dark orange arrows are things that are not quite here yet, but that we're concerned about. And so the thing that has changed is, and you've probably heard this, is that the spotted lantern fly was not in Kentucky prior to 2023, and now it is here. It has been found um, in sort of the northern Kentucky area in the summer of 2023, so its arrow is now yellow. But as you can see, there are several creatures coming to us at once, and that's why um, we're so concerned about invasive species for this Kentucky Keepers project, and we will discuss several of these in this uh, Invade It lesson. Oh, and by the way, if I do happen to mention other times in this lesson that spotted lanternfly is not here yet, um, that's just something left over from the old version of the video. We'll try to remove those things um, in future versions of this. But this is invaded, so it's about 11 pages long. It's a PDF, it's black and white, so we've, we've made it all black and white so that it's easy to photocopy, easy to print, and it's free to distribute. We're gonna have it uh, we're going to have it in several places. You can get it. Uh, it'll probably be on Nearpod. It will uh, probably be in a, a OneDrive or a SharePoint kind of location, some kind of shared drive. And we'll also have the, P the PDF on our website. So there'll be lots of places that you can that you can download and give this to people. We have aligned it to next generation science standards, as we'll show. There's a couple of specific next generation science standard bullets that fit really well with not only with this lesson plan, but with invasive species in general. The one thing that's pretty unique about this is that it's designed for specifically for Kentucky. There are a handful of invasive species lesson plans for youth out there, but ours is specifically about Kentucky and Kentucky insects. So that makes it something that, that is kind of special just for us. We've designed it mainly for approximately grade three through five. You could definitely use it with kids older than that, certainly into middle school and maybe early high school. I think it would be valuable for all of those. But as far as the next generation science standard bullets, it's, it's really well aligned with, uh, with grades three through five, as we'll see. Um, we've designed it so that it can be completed by a 4 h -er on their own, so it's something you could potentially give them and they could do on their own for a little while or even take home with them. But they'll probably need a little, little help, especially if they're a little younger. And so going through this yourself ahead of time, using this, uh, using this video as a guide will be helpful to, to any instructor who is, who is going over this with their youth. We've patterned this after 
uh, modern um, lesson plans like this that are kind of divided into sections that are, that are handed to kids as a pack and they do it over time, sometimes alone and sometimes with other youth. This can certainly be done as a group. We've kind of designed it that, could, that, could, that it can be done one at a time. And of course, um, there's little spaces to fill out answers here, but of course they can use extra paper to fill out things if they need to do that. Here are the two next generation science standard content points that go really well with this lesson plan. And we, we kind of did this on purpose. We, we want to emphasize the science standards. So it's something that, um, you know, if you're trying to uh, uh, show a teacher the value of, of teaching invasive species in the classroom, um, here are two bullets that fit really well. So uh, 3LS1-1, that means grade three. One of the things that they expect third graders to be able to do is to develop models to describe that organisms have unique and diverse life cycles, but all have in common birth, growth, reproduction, and death. So we're gonna talk about life cycles a lot in this lesson plan. We're gonna go through the life cycles of several different creatures and the kids kind of model the life cycle by showing the different parts and by kind of cutting and pasting different parts out. And then the other bullet there is 4LS11, that means grade four. And it says, construct an argument that plants and animals have internal and external structures that function to support survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction. So this particular uh, bullet is really well suited to invasive species because one of the things we talk about invasive species, um, one of the things that they have are these adaptations. They have these structures or behaviors or internal structures that allow them to survive when they come and take over a new area. So this is actually a really great way to learn about adaptations because these adaptations are often front and center on invasive species. And then down there is, is uh, uh, the, um, the Next Generation Science Standards logo. And then down there on the right is the little block, that we, block of text that we have on the front page of this lesson plan talking a little bit about how this lesson plan is aligned to Next Generation Science Standards. Now, this is going to be the hard part. Before you do anything else, so if you're a 4-H leader, a 4-H staff member, uh, maybe even a team leader who's teaching this to younger 4-Hers, or a 4-H volunteer, or maybe a teacher who's learning about this, please do this yourself before you go through this video. Take it and, and go through it yourself. For one thing, this will give us really good feedback. If you run across something in here that doesn't make any sense, we might have time to change this before you give it to 4-Hers. This really hasn't been play tested very much yet. You're kind of the people who are the who are the play testers. So, but also we want you to be familiar with this. This is another way for you as an educator to learn about this material. This might take you an hour or two. Um, it's a kind of a two-part lesson plan, like we said, with 11 pages. So it will take a while. Um, you could do it over multiple days. It's kind of, we kind of imagine that if a 4-H'er was doing it, they might do it over multiple uh, club days. Maybe do part one one day and part two another day or part, do part one in the club and do part two at home. So go ahead and, um, and take your time to do this. I'll be right here. Pause this and come back. So now let's actually go through the lesson plan page by page and we'll give um, you know, possible responses to all these different answers, to all these questions that they, that they are asked to answer. So here's the first page of Invade It. It talks about the materials that are needed to complete this lesson plan. For one thing, each uh, youth is going to need a printed out and hopefully stapled together copy of Invade It, but they will also need internet access, either on a computer, a smartphone, a laptop, something like that. Uh, because there's videos for them to watch. There's a web page that we've designed that has some basic information about some invasive species. And they also might need to do things like check Wikipedia for information about invasive species. So they will need that. They will also need pen or pencil to complete the thing. Pencil would probably be better because they might need to do some erasing. Uh, one thing I don't have listed here, but some scrap pieces of paper in case they need two extra pages to draw or to answer things. They'll need scissors because they'll need to cut out some life stages and other things to sort of move around inside the lesson plan. And they'll also need some glue or tape to affix those things that they cut out. And then the first thing that we ask everybody to do is to watch this cane toad video. This cane toad video is from Real Science. It's a really good video. Um, it's narrated by something. I don't know if they're an actual high schooler, but they sound very young. So they have a kind of a young perspective on, uh, on this video. It's a very entertaining and interesting video. 
of all about cane toads, which were which are a very interesting and classic study in how invasive species kind of work, the traits that they have, the problems that they cause, uh, the things that we try to do to slow them down. Um, they can stop after about 14 minutes. I think after that, it's um, things to sort of advertising other real science videos and, and so forth. But please uh, have youth watch this video first. Now, the next page is going to be our pre-survey. This is really important. In extension, of course, we know that getting data on the effectiveness of programming is very critical. So we have a pre and post survey for this lesson plan. So uh, hopefully, um, as you were going through this as an, as, as an educator, you did the pre-survey as well. But please give them the pre-survey and also the post-survey. And if you can figure out any way to get it back to us, I know this is on paper, so it, it might not be as easy to get it back to us, um, but there's several different ways you could get it back to us. You could take a picture of the pre and post survey and send it to us. You could maybe staple the whole thing together and copy it and send it to us. Um, you could just send all of them, mail them all to us. Uh, you could scan them, fax them. Uh, there's lots of different ways. Just try to get them to me at, at my email address there. Try to keep the pre and post test together. They can be anonymous but try to keep the pre and post test together so that, we'll, so that we can see and compare the results. And obviously the more evaluation data that we get, the better. So please have them do the uh, pre-survey. They're, uh, they're just basic questions about invasive species and the post-survey will be the same questions. So here are the first two kind of content pages of the lesson plan. And this is kind of what we're calling part one of the lesson plan. And it's mostly about cane toads and invasive species in general. We're not talking too much about invasive insects yet. So they'll use these two pages along with the resource page to complete these first two pages, which is part one. This is what the resource page looks like. This is towards the end of the whole document because it's used for both part one and part two. It's got um, some life stages that people will cut out. It's got some other creatures that they'll cut out. It also has a word bank with sort of ideas to use for invasive species adaptations. So this is something that can be used throughout the lesson. And now we're going to go through part one. So you'll notice as you go through this whole lesson plan that some of the sections are upside down and sideways. This is on purpose. We've seen this on other lesson plans. That, that teachers use. It's just kind of tr to make it fun to introduce movement into the lesson plan. So they'll have to kind of turn it around and upside down. One of the things that emphasizes that on some of these pages, it doesn't really matter what order they do the things. Um, so uh, it gives them kind of a freedom of movement, literally. Now this page does remind at the very top to watch the cane toad video first. That's kind of important. We mentioned that on the very first page as well but it is kind of important to watch the cane toad videos before they try to answer these next sections. Otherwise, this can be done in any order. And we're gonna go through each of these little sections on the first page. So one of these sections is called answer it. So after watching the cane toads answer these questions, one of the questions is why were cane toads brought to Australia? And as you'll see in the video, they were brought to Australia to, to kill something called the um, cane beetle, which is a pain of sugar, which is a pest of sugar cane so Australians brought these toads to Australia on purpose in 1935 and just literally let them loose in Northeast Australia hope to, in hopes that they would eat this cane beetle. And the question number two is what US state did Australians bring the cane toads from? Cane toads are actually from originally South America, but they've moved around to different places over the years. And they were already in Hawaii at this time. So Australians actually brought them from Hawaii. Question three is name any native Australian animals that are threatened by the cane toad. There are actually quite a bunch of these. Some of them that the, that the cane toad eats directly by swallowing them and some that are threatened because they try to eat the cane toad, but the cane toad's poisonous. So Australian monitor lizard, northern blue tongue lizard, Australian water dragon, and several others. And then if, if the youth happen to hunt around on Wikipedia, I'm sure they'll find even more. There's probably a lot of good answers for uh, for this question and then number four list any two reasons why the cane toad is so good at being an invasive species this is one of the many times that we talk about adaptations in this lesson plan so for one thing they have poison glands it makes them poisonous for predators so that helps to protect them 
Uh, cane toads, like many toads, lay lots of eggs. They lay them underwater. So being underwater helps to protect the eggs a little bit, but also the eggs are poisonous. So very few predators will eat these eggs, and many of the toads are able to survive all the way to adulthood. Nothing eats them, so they're able to breed quickly. And then one of the things we learned in this video is that the toads seem to be evolving longer legs, which are helping them to literally hop their way across the country even faster as they spread. The next section is called Find It. What we're asking here is for the youth is for the youth um, from the video, because there's several examples mentioned in the video, but also maybe examples from their own life, or they might have to hunt around on Wikipedia or a little bit, to find five examples of invasive species of any kind from any part of the world. And the, the definition of invasive species can be pretty loose here. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's any uh, animal or plant from another part of the world that has caused problems uh, where it has gone. So there's so many examples. In the world of plants, we have kudzu, bush honeysuckle, Johnson grass, autumn olive, multiflora rose. You could also include so many of these yard weeds, dandelions, things like uh, winter creeper. Mammals, there's wild boar, house cats, nutria. Rabbits in Australia were an invasive species. Birds, European starling. Fish, we've got Asian carp in Kentucky. There's snakehead fish in other parts of the country. There's lionfish in other parts of the world. Reptiles, Florida has been plagued by Burmese pythons and iguanas. And of course, there's many, many examples of insects as we've gone over in some of the other modules. Japanese beetle, Asian longhorn beetle, Asian multicolored ladybug, brown marmorated stink bug, hemlock woolly adelgid, so many others. So lots of, lots of uh, possible answers for that question. Now the next section is called Live It. And we're asking you to complete the cane toad life cycle using pictures from the resource page. So they have to kind of look at these pictures and see, okay, what do I think this life cycle is? I just watched the video. It showed the life cycle. Uh, and so they, they kind of need to remember, okay, what did the stages look like in the life cycle? What do I know about toads and frogs? And of course, this is related to our uh, bullet point three LS11 develop models to describe life cycles. Uh, so you'll see in Livid, it, it's got it's got a life cycle. It's got um, blank spaces for four pictures, and then down at the bottom, it also asks the youth to pick one of the life stages and describe how that life stage is invasive. So here are those life stages. I've circled the, the I've circled the actual life stages on the resource page that they would cut out. And then I've shown where they go in the diagram here. So obviously the picture of the adult toad goes at the top. And then the egg stage is next, followed by the tadpole stage that doesn't really have too much going on with legs yet. And then that goes into the tadpole stage that does have legs. And then on up to the, uh, to the adult toad. So this is a very same life cycle that all frogs and toads have in the world. And then down at the bottom, uh, and this is related to our other bullet point, our 4LS11, construct an argument that plants and animals have structures that support them with survival and growth and behavior and all that stuff. And so they can pick any one of these life cycles, any one of these stages of the life cycle, and describe what adaptation does it have that makes it invasive. So there's lots and lots of possible answers here. If they pick the adult toad, they can see that it has poison glands. That helps to protect it from being eaten by predators. They have long legs that help it to, that help them to that helps them to escape from predators and also spread to new locations. And the adult toads have these big mouths. They have a diverse diet, so they're able to eat lots of different creatures, which which makes them adaptable for lots of different um, environments. The eggs are adapted to be invasive because lots of eggs are laid, and many of those eggs survive because they're poisonous. So that protects them from from predators. And then the same thing with the tadpoles, like the eggs and the adults, the tadpole stages are poisonous, which protects them from predators. Now, the second page of our part one is called Read It. And in this case, we are asking them to read that kind of gray shaded area first. It has some facts about invasive species. And then they can do the other two sections in kind of any order that they want. But honestly, they could probably do those two sections without reading uh, the thing first, or they could just refer back and forth. So once again, it doesn't matter too much 
what order things are done on this particular part of the lesson plan. We've given the little clockwise arrows there as a suggestion, but it doesn't really matter. But let's go through these sections. So one of these sections is called Draw It. And this can be done on another piece of paper. We've only given a little, little bit of a space here. So if you want a bigger piece of paper, that would be a great idea. Or if you've done this, or if you printed this out single-sided, they could just use the back. But we're asking them to draw any real plant or animal. And it doesn't have to be an exact real plant or animal, something real basic like dog, lizard, crocodile, a moth, bird, something pretty basic. And then add things to it, change its body or behavior to make it better at being an invasive species. So there are lots and lots of possibilities here. We want them to be very creative. Um, we're not really grading this. We're just trying to see, are, do they understand some of these adaptations that invasive species have that make them invasive? So there's so many different examples. What about a winged horse that can fly to new places and fly away from predators? So horses actually already can be invasive um, in certain situations. So what if they could fly too? What about rats? Rats are invasive. The old Norway rat was an invasive species. What if they were poisonous so nothing could eat them? That would make them even more invasive. What if emerald ash borer, which is a really bad invasive insect species that's spread through uh, Kentucky already, what if it all of a sudden had, uh, had an adaptation that allowed it to eat oak instead of just ash? Then it could go back through the area that is just invaded and invade again. What if tarantula is adapted to colder temperatures so they could move north in the United States? That probably wouldn't happen, but what if what if they did? This is this is very creative, like I said. What if rabbits developed protective spines so that a few predators can eat them? They can already hop away from predators. What if they were sharp too? What if chickens um, could lay lots of small eggs at a time instead of one big egg, and then maybe were more protective of their little brood so that you got more chickens and they started uh, and they could grow really quickly? So those are some examples, and I've drawn one here as well. So my so my example is an iguana. So iguanas are already invasive in Florida. And iguanas already have some invasive traits. They can eat lots and lots of different things, especially plants, but they'll also invade the nests of animals and feed on their eggs. They'll also eat small animals. So my idea was, what if this lizard, lizards aren't very good at living in cold areas because they're cold-blooded, but what if our lizard, our iguana, had hair-like projections off of its uh, scales to help keep it a little bit warmer, and also what if it had bigger clawed legs so that it could dig burrows. This might allow it to spread north and become an invasive species in colder areas instead of just uh, Florida where it is now. So none of this is likely to happen and it may not even actually work. I don't know if hair would actually actually help lizards stay any warmer since they're cold-blooded, but um, it's just a creative idea. Now invaded, this section is showing specific kind of traits or adaptations and we're asking our youth to describe how these adaptations can help a creature. So this is once again in support of bullet point four LS11, um, where youth construct an argument that plants and animals have structures that help them to survive. And so there's uh, lots of answers for these too. So sharp claws, this is something that house cats have. House cats can be invasive in certain situations. So some invasive species like house cats have sharp claws that make them really good hunters. They can catch and kill native animals, and that's how they survive, is by catching easy to, ki easy to catch native birds and stuff like that. Um, seeds. Many invasive plants make lots of seeds. So dandelion is a classic example of this. They make these tiny little seeds. They make a whole lot of them, and the seeds are actually able to float in the air to new areas. So that's one way that seeds can be invasive. Poison or venom. We've already talked about that with cane toad. If an animal is poisonous, very few people, very few predators will eat it. So this protects them and allows them to spread even more. And, and or they might have venom in spines or fangs that, that might allow them to protect themselves uh, so that very few things will attack them. And then roots. Um, the youth might have to think about this one a little bit since we haven't talked too much about plants yet. But if, uh, if a plant has roots that spread sideways really fast, they can grow new parts of a plant and, and spread that way. So that's how kudzu spreads. Or some roots will dig very deep tap veins down into the earth that help to, that help to protect them so that if the top part of the plant gets, gets lopped off, they can grow back up 
Dandelions do this, and so do lots of our invasive bushy and tree-like plants like honeysuckle and, um, and, and us, uh, some of our other ones that are sort of bushy and shrubby that are woody plants. So there are um, lots, lots of different ways that, that these different traits can help a creature or a plant be invasive. So that's it for part one. And like I said, we kind of imagine maybe part one is done one day and part two is done another day. Part two might be a little longer, so part two might even take two days to do. But part two consists of five pages. One of these pages is just information as opposed to something that the youth have to do. And these pages also aren't quite as dense as the first part, so these might not take quite as long to do. But part two is really more about specific Kentucky invasive species, either ones that are already in Kentucky or ones that threaten Kentucky, whereas part one of Invade It was more about cane toads and invasive species in general. But you'll see that um, this part two has a lot in common with part one. One thing that youth will use a lot during this part of the lesson is a website that we've made that uh, the, the main purpose of this website is to go through four of our main invasive species and it talks about them in paragraphs. So there's some reading comprehension that our youth are going to have to do, their, do here. They're going to have to read these paragraphs, understand what they say, and then answer questions about what's going on in these lesson plans. So let's go through each of these sections. So here's our first page of part two. What this is asking is for the youth to go to that website that we mentioned and to read about some of our invasive species, in particular Asian longhorn beetle and spotted lanternfly on this page, and to answer some questions about them and also to um, cut out, once again, to cut out and, and fill in the pictures. These are almost like little trading cards that go with each creature, a little profile pages, almost like little uh, um, FBI most wanted kinds of pages, and the youth are kind of filling out the missing information. Some of the missing information is sort of hard to find where it is because some of the information is already filled out and some of it we've left blank, blank spots here. So I'm going to kind of lead everyone through this. So this is another slide that we had to re-record because of the status of spotted lanternfly. And uh, first up here on uh, this part of the invaded lesson is Asian longhorn beetle. So um, in this case, we have filled out quite a bit of the information about Asian longhorn beetle already over here. So this, the uh, youth don't have to fill this part out. It says where it's from, when it was found in the USA, stuff like that. But we do want them to go to the resource page and cut out the Asian longhorn beetle drawing and bring it up and put it here in the profile picture. So that's something that they will do. And then the main thing we're asking them here is problems caused by Asian longhorn beetle. So hopefully they can think of quite a few of these after learning a bit about them. Um, so some of the problems is that it feeds on a variety of important Kentucky trees, including maple trees, but some others as well. And when those larvae are in there, they eventually kill the trees. And what, what's really difficult to deal with with the Asian longhorn beetle is that it's hard to detect. It's very hard to find and, and control this thing because the egg, the larva, and the pupal stages are all hidden inside the trees. So the only part you can actually see is the beetle, and it will only be around for a few weeks every year. So these problems, um, a tree might be infested with this thing, or a stand of trees might be infested for a while before anyone knows about it. So those are some things that makes um, the Asian longhorn beetle very difficult to deal with as an invasive species. And now with spotted lanternfly, so we had to change this. So um, we're at, we tell uh, the youth where it's from. It's from Asia, but we're asking when it was first found in the USA, and they would fill out 2014. And then is it in Kentucky yet? And of course it is in Kentucky now. It was found here in 2023. So they can fill that out right there. And down here we're asking them to fill out invasive traits of the spotted lanternfly. So this is a little different question than what we asked over here with Asian longhorn beetle, which was what problems does it cause? In this case, we're asking kind of why is the Asian, why is the spotted lanternfly so well adapted to be an invasive species? And so there's a couple of things here. Uh, it feeds on a variety of plants. So um, if one of the plants that it eats is missing, it might be able to find something else. It can quickly jump or fly from predators, so it makes it hard for something to catch it and eat it. And even if they did, these things seem to taste bad. They get chemicals from their plants, apparently, um, store these in their bodies, makes them bad tasting, so very few things will eat them. 
And of course, like many invasive species, these things lay lots of eggs and they breed quickly. So those are some of their invasive traits. And then we would also ask the youth to cut out the picture of the spotted lanternfly and move it up into this area. And then down at the bottom, it's kind of hard to see, but we've, we have filled in some of the problems caused by spotted lanternfly. It feeds on grapes, soybeans, and many other plants. So this page is very similar to the last page, except it's two different invasive species that have threatened Kentucky. So first here is spongy moth. And once again, we're asking them to fill out some missing information. In this case, when was it found in the United States? It was found in 1869 when they were brought here on purpose to in an attempt to create a new silk industry, but it didn't work. What's the life cycle? And this, this is very general. We don't want them to, to list the whole life cycle. We're just asking for the basic life cycle. Egg, larva, pupa, adult. And it mentions that a little bit on that web page, but they have to in, interpret that a little bit. We just want them to understand the main parts of the life cycle, that they have an egg, larva, pupa, and adult, which we'll see as, as has many of our invasive species have that same life cycle. And then it's asking once again for problems caused by spongy moth. And the problems are that it feeds on leaves of oak and other trees. It sometimes eats all the leaves off of a single tree year after year, eventually weakening and killing these trees. And it's very dangerous, especially for small trees. And then the eggs are protected from predators. So this moth is able to spread to new places really easily. Now imported fire ant, we filled out most of that information there, but we want them to fill out life cycle. So the life cycle for this is the same as spongy moth, basically, because they have a complete insect life cycle. They have egg, larva, pupa, adult. And now we're asking for both invasive traits and problems caused. So invasive traits of imported fire ant. The workers and the soldiers are very quick moving. They have stingers and they are able to quickly defend their hives from danger. So very few predators can get at a fire ant nest. This protects them from anything that wants to disturb them. And then they also spread, like many invasive species, they can spread easily. They can spread by sending new queens out that establish new colonies. And then some of the problems caused by fire ants, mostly from the stinging. So whenever there's mounds of these fire ants in places where livestock live, the, the, the livestock step on them, they get stung, can cause lots of problems for livestock. Of course, if the ants are in yards, they can be dangerous to children and pets, and especially people who are sensitive to stings. And they also disrupt lawns and other, uh, other places where people are trying to grow things by just all this mound building. It almost causes some of the same problems that tunneling moles uh, can cause. And here are the pictures that they, that they will need to cut out. There's fire ant, and here is actually the whole spongy moth life cycle right here that will be cut out and put into the profile page. Now this page is just an information page. There's nothing that the youth have to do here except read it. This is showing the two main insect life cycles. Uh, once again, we're emphasizing life cycle in this lesson plan. Insects, as probably everyone knows but may have forgotten, maybe they learned it a long time ago, Insects will go through one of two main kinds of life cycles, what we either call incomplete or complete. The ones with incomplete life cycles start out as eggs. They hatch into something called a nymph, and then the nymph doesn't really change much when it becomes an adult. It gets wings and it's able to lay eggs, but otherwise it's still basically the same shape. It's just gotten bigger. That's the incomplete life cycle. There are some examples in this paragraph of some creatures that do incomplete life cycles, grasshoppers, crickets, roaches, praying mantids, and several others. And then some insects have what we call a complete life cycle. This is where they start out as an egg, they turn into some kind of a larva, which is usually worm-like or caterpillar-like, usually soft, very different from whatever adult it turns into. It will live in this larval stage uh, for many stages. It will shed its skin and get, and get larger, but still be a worm-like creature for a while. Then eventually it will make something called a pupa or a cocoon, where the larva totally changes its body. It almost gets melted down and liquefied and reformed, and then it turns into the adult, which is very, very different. This happens with butterflies, but it also happens with every beetle in the world every true fly in the world, so house flies and mosquitoes do this. Also bees, ants, and wasps all do this. More species go through complete life cycle than incomplete life cycle. 
But this is just a review of that because we're going to ask some more stuff about life cycles here on this next page. So in this page, we're talking a whole bunch about life cycles about two specific invasive species, the spotted lanternfly and the spongy moth. As we'll see here, they have two different kinds of life cycles. Spotted lanternfly has the incomplete life cycle. Spongy moth has complete life cycle. And we're asking the youth to find from the resource page the missing parts of the life cycle. We're also asking them to pick one of the life stages and describe an adaptation of that life size of that life stage that makes it invasive, kind of like we did with cane toad in part one. So let's go through these answers here. Starting with spotted lantern fly here with the incomplete metamorphosis, we've gone ahead and put in the egg stage because the egg doesn't really look like anything. So that might be a little bit hard for people to figure out. So we've added the egg already. But now uh, from that web page that, we've, that we're asking the 4-Hers to look at, this one right here, the section about spotted lanternfly does show pictures of the nymph and the adult, but the, the, the youth may still have to interpret this a little bit because the pictures here on this page look a little different from the ones on, on the website. They're still the same creatures, but they're black and white. They're a little bit different orientation. But this one down here is the nymph. So this is the nymph stage of the spotted lanternfly. It doesn't have wings. It's a little bit hard to, to tell that it doesn't have wings, but one of, the, one of the kind of clues on insects in general is if you see these segmentation marks down here, a lot of times that, mean that, the, that means that there's no wing covering that insect because those, those segmentation marks will be hidden if the insect has wings. So this is the spotted lanternfly nymph. And this is the adult. So the adult does have wings that covers over its abdomen. On a color uh, spotted lanternfly, it was, it's going to have gray, kind of almost grayish, pinkish wings with black spots. But here's what it looks like in black and white. So this is the whole spotted lanternfly life cycle. And now on to spongy moth uh, life cycle. Spongy moth has the complete life cycle. And in this case, we're asking for several things here. For one thing, they have to find all the different parts of the spongy moth life cycle except for the egg. We already have the egg filled in here. because Once again, the egg just kind of doesn't look like anything. So we've kind of done that for them. But here's the larva. The larva is over here. The larva of the spongy moth looks kind of like any typical caterpillar with fur all over it. We're also asking them to fill in the name of the life stage here. We're asking them to actually write the word larva there. And then the pupa is over here. The pupa looks like kind of any typical moth pupa. It just kind of has that pupa kind of look to it. And then the adult spongy moth just looks like a regular moth. And that is here, and it goes into this space. And down at the bottom, we're asking to fill in some additional information as well, where, where they are picking one of the life stages from above and describing something about it that makes it invasive, some trait or adaptation. And once again, there are many, many different possible answers here. So for spotted lanternfly, the adults, they taste bad to predators. They lay lots of eggs. The, <coughs> the egg stage, you can also say that lots of eggs are laid. So that's kind of a trait of both the adult and the eggs. And then the eggs are covered with a gunk that the mom puts on them that helps to protect them from both the wet, weather and predators. And then the nymphs are also bad tasting to predators. The nymphs and the adults can also jump away from predators, so that makes them invasive as well. And then for, um, same thing with spongy moth, the adults, uh, the adult males can fly to new places. The eggs are covered with a protective sticky gunk. The larvae eat and grow quickly. They also can eat a variety of different things, and they're covered with this hair that protects them from predators. So these creatures both have lots of adaptations that help to make them invasive. So on this page, we're getting close to the end, and we're asking once again for youth to visit this web page, which is the same web page we've been talking about that just kind of goes through four of our different invasive species um, that we're concerned with in Kentucky and talks about them, and then that we ask them to answer stuff on this page. And on this page, we're talking about the four main strategies for dealing with invasive species, prevention, monitoring, education, and control, and we're asking them just to look through those paragraphs on that web page about our four invasive species and to fill out the, the missing information here. And basically what it's asking is, on prevention, for instance, it's saying, name any invasive species, 
and name something that people are doing to try to prevent it from spreading. Now, it doesn't have to be one of the four invasive species from that page. They could pick something else, um, some other creature somewhere or other plant that people are trying to prevent from invading. But the example I picked here was Asian longhorn beetle. And one of the things that we're trying to do to prevent it is that the government has quarantines on this creature that make it so that people who are working in places where Asian longhorn beetle might spread, they have to have permits to deal with certain movement of lumber and that kind of thing. So that's an example of something being done to try to prevent Asian longhorn beetle. There are many, many possible answers for this question. Some of these are a little bit of a kind of a gray area, like what's prevention and what's education, for instance. So you use some wiggle room and creativity. We just kind of want them to understand that lots of different things are being done a multifaceted approach to dealing with invasive species. So monitoring. One of the things that's done for monitoring is Kentucky keepers. Kentucky keepers put out traps for the spongy moth. So that's a way to monitor for, um, for invasive species that might be getting close to a new area. And then education. Education, there's lots of different examples of educating for in, invasive species. So these modules are educating for invasive species. One of the things that we do with spotted lanternfly is that we just want the public to know what it looks like. If they just know what it looks like, they can report it to us um, either to their extension office or through the report a pest uh, email. So that's a way to educate. It's just to let people know what these things look like. And then control would be the step when you found the creature and you want to kill it and keep it from spreading even further. And fire ant is a really good example. Whenever we find fire ant mounds, we, um, we treat them usually with pesticides to try to wipe them out, at least in that space, so they can't spread from that space any further. So those are our four main strategies for dealing with uh, invasive species. Now, don't forget the post-survey. Hopefully, youth took the pre-survey. The post-survey is the same questions. Um, once they do this, try to keep the post-survey and the pre-survey together, even if it's anonymous. And well, like I said, please try to figure out a way to share this information with us so that we can see um, how effective uh, all this stuff is. And now our last section of the lesson plan should be considered as optional. This is this is a state. This is a part that can't necessarily be done all in one day. This would be considered kind of a long term project or an idea or a jumping point for future projects either a project that a club could do, a 4-H club, or something that um, an after-school club, or maybe even a classroom can do. And this is what, what we're calling information invasion, where we want the youth to invade the world with information to let people know about invasive species. And it's basically just a planning tool for putting together some kind of presentation. So we ask them to select an invasive species, pick what type of presentation that they're going to do. Are they going to do a social media video? Are they going to make a poster? Are they going to give a talk to younger kids? What are they going to do? And then it just gives a whole lot of, of questions for the youth to think about as they're developing their presentation. And then we encourage them to share this with us. Like if they make a video, they can share that with us through social media. If they make a poster, they could scan it and send it to us. So this is uh, just optional, but, it, but it's hopefully something that could be kind of considered an expanded project um, that youth might want to do. Please share with us anything that is done along these lines. And as we've mentioned before, that this doesn't have to be necessarily uh, something that's done at, uh, at a 4-H office. This can be something that a single youth takes with them and converts into a homework project. So something that is something that their teacher is already asking them to do, like write a report on something. Maybe they can pick a spotted lanternfly instead of, you know, uh, um, mummies or something, just a, just a way to bring their information closer to home um, and something that can actually be helpful for other people to learn as well. And so that's it for Invade It. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty long, pretty involved uh, lesson plan. Hopefully you find it valuable. Hopefully um, you, can, you can figure out ways to, to piece, it, piece it out. You can just use part one, part two. Uh, maybe do, you can just find just one or two elements in it that you like. But like I said, what we really need from you is feedback. So please figure out a way. If you can't figure out a way to get it, to get the, um, the results to me or the, uh, uh, the, the pre and post survey especially, and even the whole thing, I'd like to see the whole thing that kids fill out. 
You can scan it. You can just mail the whole thing to me in a big envelope. Uh, keep it, keep it together just in your office. And when I come through that part of the state, I can pick it up. We'll figure out some way uh, to get it. But I would really like to see that. And of course, if you have questions about this lesson plan, um, ask me. If you have questions about the apps and so forth, ask Carl on those two uh, emails there, and hopefully we'll see you again.